NCR Corporation is a leader in omnichannel solutions, turning everyday interactions with businesses into exceptional experiences. With its software, hardware, and portfolio of services, NCR enables nearly 700 million transactions daily across financial, retail, hospitality, travel, telecom, and technology industries. NCR solutions run the everyday transactions that make your life easier. NCR is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, with about 30,000 employees and does business in 180 countries. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, how many of you grew up like I did and you wanted to fly with your own human power? I still want to fly with my own human power today. So I grew up as a kid like all of you, um, wanting to fly and thinking that it was possible by either my own power or maybe even riding my bike. How many people remember E.T. the Extraterrestrial? So that was during my time when I was growing up, when I was a kid like you. So I thought I could ride my bike fast enough and get off the ground. Boy, was I, that, that not possible for me. I didn't know, I didn't understand the laws of physics or aerodynamics. So, but I got interested by that movie in, into science and engineering. And then later, when I was even a smaller kid, when I was five years old, I saw Neil Armstrong walk on the moon while my father was fixing a black and white television with funky antennas that were like hangers out of your uh, closet trying to get the screen and the, and the reception to come in. That's how I got interested in space. And then some 40 years later, I would literally meet Neil Armstrong at a celebration about the moon landing. What, a, what an event for me. I later would go to school. I would go to UC Berkeley. I'm, I'm from California originally. Cho chose a mechanical engineering degree. And then I went to graduate school to get a degree in aeronautics and astronautics to do research related to flight, space flight, and to become an engineer and become an aerospace engineer, which I love the subject so much today. So I'm going to talk to you about something that really kind of brings my sort of life together about something that I always wanted to fly, but I knew I couldn't fly with my own energy. But how could someone do that? How could we develop a system that could do that following the sort of dream of da Vinci? So today's talk, if I can get the first chart, um, I'll talk about our fascination of flight, which I just did a little bit about. Then I'll talk about what does the math say in terms of us as humans getting off the ground? Can humans sustain longer flight times if they have some kind of mechanical system that helps them get off the ground? And then we'll go through the history of human-powered flight and how many accomplishments there's already been. And then I'll talk to you about a project that we worked on called Gamera. And by the way, the word Gamera comes from, and maybe the, the older people in the room will know this, from um, the Godzilla movies. And it's about a flying turtle. So I, I work at the University of Maryland. Our mascot is a turtle called a terrapin. So we did, decided to use the Godzilla's name of G Gamera as the name of our project. And then I'll talk about some final thoughts about the project. So in the 1400s, da Vinci was this incredible Renaissance person. He basically was an artist, an engineer, a scientist, an inventor, he just was in full of ideas. One of the ideas that he sketched up in his manifesto was essentially something called a corkscrew or an air screw design. And basically, his conception was that humans could develop a system and generate their own power and possibly get off the ground. Now, this was in the 1400s. It has taken us 400 plus years to achieve da Vinci's thought. First, we started with the Wright Flyer, the first powered aircraft by the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk in 1903. Then we took it the next step to a hovering powered system, a helicopter that could literally hover, and that took another 40 years in the 1940s. But as humans, we've always been fascinated by our ability either, either through a superhero to get off the ground, or for those of you who are older like me and saw Michael Jordan do this dunk, <laughs> at the 2000, it was the 1995 dunk competition of the NBA. And we, when we watched it the first time, we thought he was in the air forever. Turns out he was only in the air for less than a second. But it seemed like forever to everyone. 
And then, of course, just a few years ago, the skydiving from space. Humans have always been fascinated with being three-dimensional. See, we're all confined to this room two-dimensionally. Because you know why? If we try to jump, we come right back down because of gravity, right? It's hard to get off the ground. But we've been fascinated with flight either through a mechanical system or through our own human power. So I'm going to sh show you what the math says. These are two examples. I've already talked about the first one. So when Michael Jordan was part of this 1995 NBA dunk competition, and he did the dunk, which started at the free throw line and went all the way to the basket, some uh, mathematicians and scientists did some calculations on, on the trajectory that he achieved and under gravity. His hang, tang was, hang time, which is the time that he stayed aloft, was about 0.92 seconds. His velocity was about 4.5, vertical velocity, not the horizontal, but the vertical velocity to get off the ground was about 4.5 seconds, meters per second. Now, you probably all heard of Michael Jordan, but the next person you probably have never heard of in your life, he's an actual USC football player who was measured at a Nike competition just on his vertical ability to jump and lift himself off the ground with his own energy. It turns out humans can't do that very well either, but he could do it extremely well. It turned out he got as high as 47.1 inches. Turns out there has yet to be a human who has measured over 50 inches on a vertical jump with their own power. But 47.48 seems to be the human limit. His vertical velocity was 4.31 meters per second, and his total altitude, as I said earlier, was 47.1. Now, Lewis, if you go to YouTube and you see the video, at the apex of his jump, he seems to stay stationary for just a few fractions of a second. It's actually very interesting. He actually changes his dynamics to hold himself at that altitude for just a few fractions of a second. But all of his dynamics are governed by Newton's second law just like Michael Jordan's are. So humans are limited by their ability and the energy that they possess to get off the ground, and it turns out that energy for a spot moment is not more than a duration of about a second. No one has ever gotten over a second to stay off the ground with their own energy. So that's a limit, but physics never lies. But we still have this passion. We, as humans, want to get off the ground. Da Vinci had an idea. Is this, this is the idea even plausible? Can humans, through their own energy, wrapped with a mechanical system around them, get off the ground for a lot longer than a second? We already know that the limit is a second now. So there have been several people over the years, over, over all of 400, 500 years now, who have tried multiple ideas. One was a gentleman by the name of Otto Lilienthal. Now, you might think he like many of us, watch birds and large birds of, of prey, and he thought he could promote a mechanical system and flap his arms fast enough to get off the ground. Do you think he was successful? No. no. Turned out he could glide very well, but he couldn't sustain himself for a lot longer time period. He could glide for many, many seconds, but that's only if he had a running start and just kept going horizontally across the ground. And he would get off if he was on top of a hill, but then obviously he would fly down and glide down in the glide path. This was a dangerous thing to try. It turned out that he lost his life on one of his jumps. Sorry, sorry to say that. However, but a team at MIT figured it out. Indeed, all of us have ridden a bike, right? All of us have ridden a bike, so we know that we can pedal. Um, we pedal ourselves from point A to point B. It turns out that if you make a system that uses the best parts of our body to generate energy, which is our legs and our arms, it turns out that if you wrap a system around that and you aerodynamically and make the structures lightweight and aerodynamically efficient, that you can build a human-powered airplane powered by someone in this audience that literally, if you're in great condition, which I am not, <laughs> if you're in great condition, you can actually fly an aircraft from the island of Crete to the island of Santorini in the Mediterranean for three, over three hours, over 74 miles, and three hours and 54 minutes of flight time. Turned out that was the record ever done of a human-powered aircraft in 1988. Now, it turned out I was a student at MIT during the same time as a graduate student, and my 
office mate was the chief engineer of this project. So I got to know it very well. So it turns out that answering this question about Da Vinci, could you get off the ground with your own human power and sustain flight if you had a mechanical system wrapped around you? The answer is definitely yes. But that's for a fixed wing flight. That is, you can go horizontally across the ground or above the ground, but you're not hovering. Hovering is much harder than going across by fixed wing. But this is doable by your own power. So in 1980, the American Helicopter Society established something called the Igor Sikorsky Prize because they wanted to see could Da Vinci's question still be answered? Because even though the Daedalus flight was fantastic, it didn't truly answer uh, Da Vinci's question, which is, could a human power themselves off the ground and hover for a long period of time? So the American Helicopter Society came up with this sort of arbitrary metrics. They said, let's establish a competition. Let's see if there's a group of um, teams out there that might can develop a system that can hover for 60 seconds, maybe get about 10 feet, uh, 10 feet off the ground, excuse me, three meters off the ground, about 10 feet, 9.8 feet, and then stay within a region of about 10 meters by 10 meters. And I tell you what, to, to incentivize them, we'll give them, make the prize $25,000. Well, it turned out it was really, really hard to solve this problem. So this problem, which was proposed by the Igor uh, Sikorsky uh, competition, the American Helicopter Society, um, led to a lot of work over many, many years. First, we were inspired by Da Vinci in 1490. Then, as I mentioned earlier, it turned out that doing the fixed wing or sort of the horizontal flight was a little easier. And there were many, many um, uh, systems that were developed prior to getting to the hovering systems. So the Gossamer Condor and the Gossamer Albatross, which actually won the Collier Trophy, a very prestigious prize in the aerospace field. And then came the, the, the prize was announced in 1980. But then came the big flight from the MIT team at Daedalus in 1988, and that sort of three hour and 54 minute flight across the Mediterranean, which set a new world record. It still hasn't been broken, by the way, today. And then, some almost 20 years later, you see the first team starting to work on could we actually solve Da Vinci's question or answer Da, Vinci, da Vinci's question? And this was a team at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, and they built the Da Vinci III mechanical system and they only got about 6.8 seconds off the ground. And it was only maybe 10 inches off the ground. Then came a team out of Japan, the Yuri-1, which actually was a very nicely designed system and it flew for about 19.4 seconds, but again, not coming close to the Sikorsky Prize of 60 seconds. And then we get to where we are today. And I was part of a team, I helped lead a team at University of Maryland that developed a system called Gamera, Gamera 1, 2, and 3. And essentially, uh, it has achieved all of the conditions of the Sikorsky Prize over time. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. It's called Team Gamera. Formed in 2008 at the Alfred Gessler Rotorcraft Center, it involved actually over a couple hundred students, maybe 200 students now, greater than actually 30,000 human hours working on this project over about five or six years. And again, I, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the gamma term is this um, creature from the Godzilla movies of the 1970s and 80s when I grew up, um, but it's a flying turtle. And of course, the University of Maryland's mascot is a, is a turtle, so we had to have a flying turtle. So that's where that comes from. So what were some of the key technical challenges of this project? Rotorcraft are much more complicated to develop and design than fixed wing aircraft. And it turns out the power required to get to, to attain hovering flight is two to three times more than is what is required for fixed wing flight. That's why you saw a lot of fixed wing systems ahead of the rotary wing systems. Number two, you as humans all of us are poor power plants. We are the worst power plants you've ever seen in your life. And I'll, I'll show a chart, you'll see where I'm coming from. We're terrible power, we don't generate much energy for whatever appendages we have and whatever muscle structure we have. Number three, we must minimize power required to hover. So there's the amount of power required to stay at altitude. We want that to be the least amount of power that is required to do that. So we need high aerodynamic efficiency. We need a very lightweight structural system to do it. Number four, 
we must maximize power available. The how much power we get out of the human, we want to maximize it to the best of our ability. So, so now we need to study human mechanics and human power. So we need humans who have high power to weight ratios. By the way, what do you think would be some of the best athletes that would be good pilots for this system? What do you think? Runners? Yes. Uh, swimmers are good, but they they're tend to be long and a little bit too heavy. Nope, not pole vaulters. Turns out to be distance runners and wrestlers. Okay, so let me tell you why humans are poor power plants. This shows why humans are very, very poor power plants. Take a look at electric motors, turbine engines, piston engines, steam engines. Notice that these are orders of magnitude of what we call specific power. That is the amount of power per pound of system. And humans are at least two to three to four orders of magnitude lower in their specific power output than any of the mechanical things that we've ever developed in time. So we're terrible, but we're still gonna do something. We're gonna try to build a system that has a certain weight you, you, you as humans stay along, most of us live in this range. I'm on the high side over here. Most of you are down here <laughs> in terms of your weight. But this is, through, these are, this is how much power you generate as a human. If you're the most efficient human, this is how much you actually generate. Three 150 watt light bulbs. If you were, at, if you were a peak cyclist or a peak wrestler or a peak long distance runner, over a very short period of time, you could literally generate possibly 400 to 450 watts. Now, most people in this room could never generate 450 watts of power over just 10 seconds. It's extremely hard to do. Nevertheless, there are humans that can do that, and therefore they fit in our range of the available power required and the right weight. The other thing we discovered is that we did a, little, a couple of performance tests. This is actually one of our um, pilots who was actually a long distance runner named Colin. And Colin uh, was working on a sort of, uh, which you would see at a physical therapy office, one of these sort of rotary systems that allows you to measure your functionality of your arm motion and your mechanics. But if you measured both the leg motion plus the arm motion and you computed the specific power over a certain time period, it turns out that if you did both legs and you did hands and feet, you get a 20% increase by using both hands and feet to generate power, which is one idea that we wanted to study for this kind of system. So what did we build? We ended up building a very high, highly efficient aerodynamic system that weighed about 100 and, uh, excuse me, 103, seven pounds, but the total flight weight to get off the ground required the pilot to only be about 107 to 110 pounds. And the maximum dimension of this system was incredibly large, 103 feet in any given direction. And as you can look at it, it looks like the equivalent of your quadcopter that you buy out of a store but scaled to the size of carrying a human, right? And the power loading are as, as follows. So this is what it would look like when you compare it to a full-size basketball court. It's bigger than a basketball court, at least by the width and almost as long as a basketball court. And this is a, that inset picture there is actually that system inside of one of our basketball courts at University of Maryland. So it looks like I said, a large quadcopter scaled up. And by the way, this is uh, at scale, this is a DJI Phantom. If you can see this little insert figure, scaled in comparison to our actual system that we built, right? Here's our very first flight. And you might not call it a flight at, at all for only 4.2 seconds. It's not a great video, but basically that system got up only about two inches off the ground and the pilot worked for about 4.2 seconds to do that. But we were ecstatic because that was our very first flight of our system that we designed. 
And Judy did a fantastic job getting it off the ground. And that's Judy in a later flight when the system got a lot better. So what we discovered is we actually, our very first version of Gamera was actually not very good. It could barely get off the ground. It weighed about 106 to 107 pounds. So we felt that we had to upgrade both the airframe and the aerodynamics of the rotor to go to Gamera 2. And as you can see, we reduced the weight of the rotors by to 35 pounds from 58 pounds, and the airframe from 32 pounds to 19 pounds. The cockpit uh, got a little stronger. It needed to be stiffer. The transmission got a little stiffer. And so the total net uh, weight savings was about 30 pounds from going from one to two. And then we realized that we actually had to extend the rotor a little bit further and taper the rotors to move to the next design to actually get more aerodynamic efficiency. And what that would allow us to do is uh, first I'll show you how the cockpit got improved. This is Judy, who was one of our pilots. She turned out to be a long distance, excuse me, a, um, a cyclist. Notice how she's struggling in this video. And then the chain breaks. It's a terrible thing. Um, and then this is compared now to this wonderfully re-engineered system with a flywheel and how smooth the transmission is for Kyle, who is the other pilot, who's also a long distance runner. So we had to improve the cockpit and the transmission to make it stiffer, but also make it smoother in terms of the transmission of power from the human to the mechanical system. What would that do for us? Well, it turns out, if you just pay attention to the right side of this chart, which shows you the maximum duration of flight and that red line there. So we want to get to 60 seconds of flight. And so gamma, if you see the top um, sort of dot of gamma one at the top there, you see that we were never going to get there with that system that we built, somewhere around 20 seconds. We improved the technology on the structures, and now that allowed us to, to get this design, which was greater than 60 seconds, a reasonable size rotor radius, and the power, specific power required was in the range of the human. So all of these things mattered to get us to a point where we could build the next system and try to fly. So we tried to do that. And this time with uh, Gamera 2, we were able to get 50 seconds of flight time, just again, based on human power and those, correct, and those innovations. And that's, uh, again, Kyle, our pilot. And then we decided to extend the radius of the rotors and taper them to make them more aerodynamic efficient. So you see that the rotors used to be rectangular. Now they're tapered, which gives them a higher aerodynamic efficiency, less weight in structures, but a little bit bigger in terms of the radius. That allowed us to now move to the next level, which is that new, that new um, sort of location on our design plot, which only requires about seven watts per kilogram a, a short rotor radius that's reasonable to design and build, and it will allow us to almost fly for 90 seconds. When we did that, we had an incredible, incredible flight. <laughs> you have no idea how much time those students have put in to get to see that result. So on that particular flight, we had no idea that that particular pilot, Henry, um, was going to get to a nine to almost 10 foot altitude because we were not trying to do that. We were just trying to fly for like 60 seconds. And then once Henry started going up, we like, well, just keep going. We'll see how high you can go because we have to do that part of the test too. So it turned out those innovations that we had put into the system ended up working. So not only could we get now the altitude, as you saw with Henry getting up to that height, we could get the duration of flight, and now we could potentially compete for the Sikorsky Prize. So everything was going well until we tried to do this flight. So Henry's doing a great job. He's getting the altitude. OK, I stop it there because I want to show you that. This comes on right. 
There we go. That line, he achieved the 10, that's the 10 foot line. So he's already at the right altitude according to the Sikorsky Prize. So we remember we had to get to the 10 foot bar and then fly for 60 seconds and stay within a 10 meter radius, which he had already stayed in. However, what happened was he started to drift. And then we had a catastrophic failure. Now, a close up of this failure, you might think that all is, all is gone. Like we're, we're, we're never gonna recover. But it turns out, it's hard for you to tell this, that actually of the entire, all the different rotor arms, only one of the older rotor arms failed. And it's a composite structure. And it turned out it was only one element in that composite structure that if we just took that element out and replaced it, the system would be fine. Within one hour, the system was flying. After what you just saw on that tape, within one hour, the system was flying. We, we the faculty, were like, oh my God, it's gonna take us another two months to figure this out. The students figured it out in a matter of an hour and had a replacement um, developed and they were actually ready to fly within two hours of that flight. So it just goes to show you that anything is possible. I'm gonna replay this video for you. Right. So we were going for the record flight during this particular attempt. Now you see that guy in the yellow jacket? That's the official um, who records the actual official flight records for um, the United States, um, for human powered flight and for all flights, even powered flights. So now just watch him as, you, as we have this catastrophic failure because he was with us for a long period of time. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, it's over. So he thought it was over too, but it wasn't. We were able to, to, to recoup and, and get another test in. So this team did an amazing job in trying to achieve the sort of notional concept of da Vinci, but also try to win the Sikorsky Prize. That's just a fraction of the couple of hundred people that were involved, um, since it went over about five or six years. Let me tell you some of the contributions that these students made toward the field. So they were the first to actually develop this now suite of human power data that involves both the legs and the arms in terms of uh, energy efficiency for using human power to transmit into all kinds of applications. Um, they also did what we call deep ground effect aerodynamic research at low, what we call low Reynolds numbers. Um, and they also came up with a patent on lightweight structures that they were able to literally uh, transfer the commercial technology to a couple of firms. One was Boeing um, that purchased some of the technology. And then many of them actually got hired um, by Boeing and several uh, uh, aerospace firms. In terms of impact and STEM impact, there were 100 million global media impressions. And there were at least 200 print or internet articles about this project over time, over the five years that we spent on this time. And there's one video that has 32 million YouTube views and the other one's cumulative of eight million, so a total of 40 million views. It's been written up by Popular Science. Um, if you do a Google search on NPR, do NPR and Gamera, you'll find a really nice documentary that was done on the team that went for about uh, this 10 minute do documentary that I couldn't play here, but you can find out. Um, and then it went overseas everywhere with different um, periodicals around the world. Interesting facts about this project. There were 5,000% more, they developed a, a system that was 5,000% more, more efficient than a conventional helicopter. And they broke four aviation world records that had not been broken. Their flight duration of 97 seconds is the longest still standing today after that flight was in 2012 and 2013. And leaps in what our understanding of what humans can do in terms of trying to achieve hovering flight. And the average age of each of the team members, because there were a few graduate students who were a little bit older, um, was 22. Most of the students were undergraduates. Um, and then it was after 33 years of people trying to win this prize, this was the first significant advance. Now it turned out, it turned out while we were working on the prize competition ourselves, another team unbeknownst to us in Canada was also working on the same competition prize. We tend to publish most of our results in the open web, they did not. So at the same time we were doing our final flight to go for the competition prize, they were doing it at the same time. And guess who won? They did. We lost by two weeks 
After five years of effort, we lost by two weeks to a team called Atlas from Canada out of the University of Toronto, who we did not know were in parallel competing against us because they never published anything. But they did a great job, and we became really great, great friends together. And so it was awesome. So some final thoughts. Da Vinci was right 500 years ago. Humans can fly under their own power if you build the right system around them. Human-powered flight is, in general, possible, but probably not practical. None of us are going to get a system and then get, fly out of this room and fly across the Potomac. It's not going to happen. We're not going to make it. <laughs> Engineered solutions make the impossible possible. And as you can tell, that project was a lot of fun. And the prize was eventually won by Team Atlas. They actually won $250,000, but because we had done so well and had started the competition, the American Helicopter Society and Sikorsky Aircraft gave our team $50,000 for their work. So they won something. And there are several links there, but I'll just leave you with the final quote. Robert Fischel, one of our alums, says, progress can only be made if one is willing to take risks and stick your neck out. So to the students in the room, be willing to dream, take risks, and stick your necks out. Thank you very much. It's an honor to speak to you today.